In today's video, I'm going to be breaking down a four-step mastering chain that you can implement into your mixes today to sound better. Are you ready? Let's go. What's going on ladies and gentlemen, this is your boy Five Piece, producer and engineer extraordinaire. Thank you for checking out today's video. I'm really excited to break down this four step mastering process, but it's important that this video comes with a disclaimer. And that is that all mastering chains are not the same and all songs are not the same. Each song is unique and different, has its own elements and loudness and other factors that play in. And that will require a different mastering chain every time. It's not uncommon to see a song that has maybe one plug in on the mastering chain, such as a limiter crank ranking the volume up, or maybe just keeping it in check. And then you'll have other songs that have 10 plugins, and I'm gonna be showing you some of that in my future mastering videos. Now, if you follow this mastering chain, you should be able to achieve a louder and fuller master, and at the same time, ensure that your song is gonna translate onto multiple streaming services, as well as different listening devices, whether it's a big speaker, or in the car, or on a laptop, or a cell phone, etc. It's gonna make sure that your song translates across all of these different mediums and devices. This video is sponsored by DistroKid. I've been personally using DistroKid for years for my own music releases, and if you're an artist or musician that's looking to get your songs on Spotify, Apple Music, and more, you absolutely have to consider using their services. Now, it doesn't just stop with getting your music onto these platforms, which is super critical, by the way. That's where everybody is listening to music now. But they also offer all kinds of promotional tools that you can use to further your release. So I'm talking about things like promo cards and mini videos. These are additional features that you can use on DistroKid, assuming that you're a member, to create new pieces of content that you can then leverage and promote on social media. So if you have a new album or a new single out, you can actually create the promotional materials on DistroKid's back end. There's so many amazing features with DistroKid, I'm really just scratching the surface. But if you want to see a cool video I did about their recent marketing feature update, I'm going to leave a link up here that you could check out and watch right now. Now, because DistroKid sponsored this video, they gave me a special link that'll give you guys watching at home a nice little discount on your first year's membership. So if you are planning on signing up, definitely hit the description below, click my link and use that to sign up. You'll get a nice little savings and access to all these features that I'm talking about. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about this four-step mastering process. So the first step of this four-step mastering process is to use MSEQ. And we're gonna have two goals with this MSEQ. The first one is to increase the amount of headroom we have available, or potentially increase it at least, using some strategic filtering. The other step that we're gonna take with this EQ is we're going to wanna remove bass from the side channels. Again, we're using MSEQ, not stereo EQ, but MS, where we're splitting the signal into a mid and a stereo channel. Now, what we want to do is, again, we're going to take the stereo channel and we're going to remove the bass. And that's because the stereo field doesn't really need bass like that. And by doing so, it's going to really concentrate the bass in the center of the track, in the mid-channel. Again, we're not getting rid of it all around and, and obviously making the track sound thinner. We're really just getting rid of it in the stereo field and therefore keeping it concentrated in the middle or the mono channel. And this is important because us humans, we have a hard time detecting where bass comes from. You'll know that if you take a bass sound and pan it far left or far right, it feels very, very strange. It's because we're not really designed to understand where bass is coming from directionally. That's why we love it when it's right down the middle and that's what the goal of this MSEQ is. So with that in mind, what I wanna do is I'm gonna obviously set this Pro Q up. I'm gonna create a low cut filter and I'm gonna first go into the side channel. So I'm changing my mode so it's out of stereo and into side. And you're gonna see that there's really not a lot of bass information on this channel at all. Or if there is, it's very not important. It's not intelligible. It's not really adding anything and it's cool to get rid of it. As a benchmark, I can generally get rid of up to 200 hertz in the stereo field using this filter and suffer very little consequences. If anything, it'll make things sound tighter. But if you do this correctly, you're really not gonna notice much of a difference at all. And all you're gonna do is really create a little bit more headroom and clarity in the mix above all else. So with that in mind, let me set this up. I'm going to just solo this frequency and listen and swipe to the right until I really hear a lot of information that seems to be a little bit more important appearing or you know, being audible, and then I'm gonna taper it back and not remove so much. So let's start with the far left at 10 hertz and bring it across. Here we go. 
So far, we're hearing nothing. So now we're starting to get something here, as you can tell, at 70 hertz. So somewhere around here, 130 seems to be a, a pretty good spot for me, at least when I'm soloing the frequency. Now I wanna double check here in context and make sure that this is the right choice. I might even A, B and bypass this and see what it sounds like, right? So let's check this out. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They can't hang with us. Involved. They ain't got no ghosts When they on they lonesome They just hate on us While I'm standing So as you can see, I actually moved a little bit more to the left. I'm removing less of the low end because I felt like things were changing just a little bit and I, I don't want this to be super, super noticeable. I'm really trying to just make sure that like 100 hertz and below is clean and allowing that sub frequency range to really be focused and in the middle. So essentially there's no more sub here on the side channel. However, it still perfectly exists in the middle. So we're not really losing anything that's important. We're just losing it in a place where we don't really need it in the first place. Now, the other thing you may be wondering is how about the mid channel? Should I be removing anything there? Uh, I'm very, very careful with that. And I typically do not like to remove anything in the mid channel. You will see people online saying, you know, get rid of th up to 30 Hertz because it's low end rumble. And I definitely used to do that. You can do that in the mid channel and achieve some more tightness. However, I find that it's very easy to make a mistake or remove too much and basically create a thinner sounding master, which we don't want. So I'm very, very reluctant to remove anything in the mid channel on the low end. I'd be much more inclined to go into the mix and maybe fix things there on the low end rather than fully remove that low end stuff. Because even though it is rumble, there is still information there, especially on big speakers that can be important. So really the first step here is we're using MSEQ but we're using really just the stereo band, the S or the side band, I should say, to filter out some of the low end, create some additional space and really have the track be focused in terms of the bass, have that bass be focused in the middle. Before I continue with the next step, I wanted to ask if you're getting value out of this video, if you like what you're seeing or if you're learning something new, please smash that like button. That would really help my content reach more people like yourself. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell. I drop something new every single week, always focused on helping you sound better and helping you make more money with your music. If you wanna help with these two areas, which are super important for the success of every musician, definitely subscribe, I'd really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to helping you in future videos. Now, with that being said, let's get back to this and talk about the next step. So the second step in this four step process is compression. And I'm specifically gonna be using downward compression. However, you could definitely replace this with upward compression. If you're unfamiliar with upward compression, it's a bit of a different process. And instead of explaining it here, I'm gonna leave a link to another video up above that you can watch. I've definitely been using this a lot more on my masters, more so than downward compression, because again, it does things a little bit differently. However, I still like using downward compression and I think that might make sense for somebody like you watching at home who's still maybe wrapping their head around mastering in general. So here I am using the BX Townhouse bus compressor and I wanna make sure that you understand my intention here is to use this very gently. I'm not trying to squash the hell out of things. I'm not trying to get massive reductions. I'm really just trying to keep everything in check. And what I mean by that is I'm trying to really take the loudest parts of the track and I'm focusing on the hook specifically as I set this, which is the loudest part. I'm trying to get those loudest elements, which is really the bass and the kick that happens simultaneously. 
I want to bring those parts down ever so slightly, but then at the same time, I might be adding some makeup gain, or maybe I won't be, we'll see, but I'm going to essentially bring down the, the loud stuff, and then at the same time, the quiet stuff is going to feel like it's a little bit more in line with it, right? Essentially, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm basically getting the track to glue together. That's what people really refer to it as, and again, it's just bridging the gap between the loudest stuff and the quieter stuff, and I find that when I do this, generally what ends up happening is the rhythm sections, like the drums and the bass, they might come down a little bit, but they might also sit a little bit better with one another. The blend between instruments might actually sit better with one another. Things may not dominate over one another, as you may hear when you don't have a compressor on. And things like the vocals just also sit better. The vocal may come up a little bit and become a bit more present, but full and in your face. And depending on the level of that, it may do the opposite. So let's see what happens here. But let me break down the settings really quick before I play this. So we're gonna set the threshold, but the ratio I have is set two to one. It's pretty gentle. That means for every two dB of volume that comes into the compressor, one is going to come out, at least the stuff that passes the threshold. So basically the really loud stuff is gonna get cut in half in terms of volume, depending on how I dial the rest of these settings in. I have a slow attack, the slowest setting possible. I like to do that because I wanna make sure that my transients and the actual rhythm stuff doesn't get squashed or pounded down in a negative way, because that'll obviously suck the life out of the track and not have it impact as much, and we don't want that. The release is set pretty quick. Not the quickest it could be, but maybe the second fastest setting possible. That's what I usually like to do, and that's to avoid any type of pumping or other stuff that may happen. Sometimes you get artifacts and distortion, depending on the compressor you use, if you set too quick of a release time. So I always set it to a you know fast, but maybe the second fastest setting. And if I want, I can of course always maneuver it and see if it sounds better with a different setting. Now the makeup gain I'm gonna leave untouched, but we would typically use this to make up for any volume that we're losing. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna dial the threshold in and pay attention to this meter here, which is the gain reduction meter. And I'm gonna to look to see maybe one dB of volume reduction at most. And if I decide to not use the makeup gain, it's gonna be because I wanna maybe drive the level up later using limiting, and instead just use this to again glue everything together. It's really gonna depend on the situation, but let's just dial the threshold in first and see what happens. So here we go. I don't know what's involved They ain't got no ghosts When they on, they lonesome They just hate on us While I'm stacking up Get my paper up I don't need them, no, sir They can't hang with us I don't know what's involved They ain't got no ghosts So I would say we're getting about a 1 dB reduction right now. You can obviously tell. You see it kind of you know, moving, the needle moving, whenever that kick and bass are happening, sometimes when the clap is happening as well. But you can tell that these are really the loudest elements in the mix, and that's what's really triggering the compression. If I were to keep going down, other things might start to trigger it as well because now we have a much lower threshold. However, I like where this is set. And now what I want to do before I even add makeup gain is I want to just hear with and without the comp, how it's affecting things. So we're not really adding any volume at all. We're really just losing, but let's see how losing volume affects what I have here. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They can't hang with us. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my. So it's interesting, if you're hearing it like I'm hearing it, there really isn't that much of a noticeable difference. It's almost really hard to tell, and I like that actually. Like, I don't think that's a bad thing. We're just keeping certain things in check. And that's obviously also creating some more headroom for us to turn things up. Whether I decide to do that now with the makeup gain or later on using something like a limiter. Just to be devil's advocate, let's actually use the makeup gain and see what happens. So I've added a full dB to fully make up for what I'm losing. Let's see the difference now in volume. And what I wanna tell you here is you gotta be mindful because when you're adding makeup gain back, this can actually become a problem. You can deceive yourself into thinking it's better, right? We always, or typically at least, think that louder is better, but louder isn't better, louder is just louder, right? So let's actually take the comp out, put it in, and see how much of a difference this is. I might back off on the makeup gain. Here we go. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my paper up. I don't need them, no, sir. They ain't hang with us. 
So I actually think this is a little bit much. So I'm going to maybe dial this back. Let's go down to a 0.5. And you got to remember, even though we're losing 1 dB, it's only happening at certain moments, not happening across the board. So me adding this much volume back, that's really affecting the stuff that isn't loud enough to get compressed, the stuff that isn't loud enough to pass the threshold. And that could be good in some situations, but sometimes it introduces problems. In this case, I'm hearing some lower frequency buildup that I don't really like, and that's going to require some additional steps to treat if I kept it like that. So I'm going to dial this makeup gain back, and let's see how this affects it. Again, we're going up 0.5 dB rather than a full 1 dB. So without it and then with it. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up. Get my paper up. I don't need them, no, sir. They can't hang with us. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up. Get my paper up. I don't need them, no, sir. They can't hang with us. So now I've dialed the makeup gain down to plus 0.3. It's such a small little move, and it's crazy because you actually do hear it. You do hear the tracks a little bit louder, a little bit fuller, a little bit thicker, and that's what I really want here. So the third step in this four step process is sweetening EQ. And I'm going to be using the UAD Pull Tech here. This is my go to for this step but you can really use anything. Even if you wanted to use another pro Q or your stock EQ, it doesn't really matter. All you need to understand is the intention. And the intention here is we're gonna generally wanna sweeten certain areas of the frequency spectrum to bring a little bit more life or pop to specific sounds that maybe occupy certain range. So let me be a little bit more specific. I like to do this to basically increase the top end the high end, the treble, whatever you want to refer to it as. And that'll usually add a little bit more shine to vocals, a little bit more presence to snares. It could also have some negative attributes. It could maybe increase sibilance and harshness, maybe bring up the hi-hats too much. These are things that we have to address when they come up. But I like to sweeten the top end, and I also like to enhance the bottom end. I like to increase the presence of the bass and the kick drum. And I want to mention that because we're mastering, whatever we do here is really going to affect everything more more or less equally. So we're not gonna be cranking the boost volume up to 10, right? That's gonna be too much. You're not gonna wanna make a huge, huge move here. Instead, we're gonna be looking to pull it up maybe one, two dB at most, but typically it's one or less. So I like the pull tech because things are in a fixed position. I choose between 20, 30, 60, and 100 hertz for the low end and you know 3K to 16K on the high end. So first thing I'm gonna do is increase my bandwidth. So it's somewhere around seven, a little bit wider. It's a wide Q. And I'm gonna completely ignore the attenuation. This is the reduction. And instead just focus on boosting. So let's do that for the low band first. I'll probably increase it significantly. And it's not gonna sound good necessarily. It'll sound overdone. But I wanna really exaggerate it first figure out which of these frequencies I like, and then I'll dial it back to maybe adding, you know, a half to a one dB, okay? So let's do this in context, here we go. I don't know what's involved They ain't got no ghosts When they on, they lonesome They just hate on us While I'm stacking up Get my paper up I don't need them, no sir They can't hang with us I don't know what's involved They ain't got no ghosts when they on, they lonesome They just hate on us While I'm stacking up Get my paper up I don't need them, no sir They can't hang with us so me personally, I'm like in this 30 hertz range. It's really low. Sometimes it's difficult to actually even hear this. And of course I am increasing it quite a bit. But each of these low bands, you can kind of see, really affects specific sounds more than others, right? 100, you're really getting a lot more of the kick. Um, and some of the bass, of course, but you're also getting some vocal. It's creating some muddiness, some boxiness potentially. So I wasn't really feeling 100. 60 hertz, you know, same kind of thing as 100 in a way. I'm still getting some of that low end of the vocal that I don't really want but I am getting a significant boost in the sub, the bass, you know, the kick. 30 hertz, I feel like I'm really focusing more on the kick and the sub. I'm getting a little bit more of the warmth that I want out of it, and I like that. Now, again, I've overdone this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually pull this back and just, you know, let's maybe increase it to one and see what that sounds like. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us while I'm stacking up. Get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They can't hang with us. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up. 
Get my paper up. I don't need them, no, sir. They ain't hang with us. So somewhere around there, which I would say it's a little bit less than 1 dB. Maybe it's 0.75, maybe it's 0.6. I'm not really sure, but I'm adding a very tiny amount at 30 hertz. And you can hear what that's doing. It's warming up the track, increasing the presence of the bass. And overall, I like what it's doing, you know? And we obviously want to be careful when adding low frequency content like this, because if you push it too much, you're going to start running out of headroom on your master. And we don't want that. You're going to run into clipping and all kinds of issues. We're really trying to preserve headroom here while at the same time adding these different frequencies and compressing and doing these different steps, right? Let's do the next thing, which is the high end. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to kind of increase this maybe to five and just sweep across the spectrum and see, you know, from three to 16K, which frequency sounds best. I find that between 10 and 16 is usually the ticket, but you know, let's see and find out what happens. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They ain't hang with us. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They ain't hang with us. So 10K seemed to be pretty good for me. Obviously, when I was sweeping around, I was listening to 12 and 16. These are a little bit lighter, and I'm sure if I was really spending a lot more time, I might choose one of them instead. But 10 is where I felt like I got a good amount of presence out of the vocal, and I also got some good presence out of the snare, the hi-hats, and the you know stuff that's in the upper harmonic range, right? the upper frequency ranges. So 10 seemed to be the ticket, and I'm adding about 2 dB. I like what that's doing. And I find that that's just sweetening everything. So again, this step is really about sweetening everything. We've done some corrective measures with the filtering at the beginning. And I'm just trying to add and enhance a little bit here. I like what's happening. And whether you use a pull tech or something else, I'm sure you can achieve a really, really great result. So the fourth and final step of this four-step process is serial limiting. I've talked about serial compression in the past. I've also alluded to serial limiting and it really is the same type of thing. What we're essentially doing is instead of having one limiter cranking the volume up and squashing the hell out of his sound, we're gonna divide that across two or more limiters and they're gonna be working a lot more gently, a lot more transparently, and you're really not gonna be able to hear the same quality that you get when you have a single limiter working really, really hard. It really just sounds a lot more transparent, less noticeable, and overall smoother, better, right? Now we have to set this up a specific way. So I got my first limiter open here, and we're not really gonna be trying to do a lot. Instead, all we're gonna do is create a 0.1 output ceiling. I have access to the attack and release settings here. So I'm gonna set a very slow attack, you know, maybe a medium release, let's say 50 milliseconds. I'll even increase my look ahead time by one, and I'll set my style to transparent. So these are the settings for the limiter, and all I'm really trying to do with this one is increase the volume if I can, or if I can't, I'm not gonna increase it at all, but really just keep it in check with this output ceiling. So let's see what happens here. I'm gonna play it, see if there's any reduction, gain reduction happening. If there isn't, I might add a little bit of volume or start adding it just to get enough of a nudge, just to see a little reduction, not a lot, just a touch, and then what I'm gonna do is on the next limiter that I'm gonna show you, that's gonna be the one where we take it and really drive the level up, and by doing this, we have the safety net of the first limiter, which prevents it from clipping, allows you to increase the volume a little bit. And then the second limiter is really going to be that thing that pushes it over the edge to 10. All right, so let's check this out. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They ain't hang with us. I don't know what's involved. No ghost. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm so this is pretty good. I actually cranked it to two at first, and I saw I was getting a little bit more reduction than I wanted, so I've dialed it down to 1.5. And as you can see, it's reducing some things, yes, but overall it's keeping things, you know, in check. Nothing's too loud. It's increasing the average volume, and you can really see it here. In fact, let me play it again and just A, B. I'll bypass and put it in. Listen to the volume difference between what we started with and what we have. And again, this is just with the first limiter. I haven't even put the second one in yet. I don't know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us. While I'm stacking up, get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They ain't hang with us. I don't know what's 
involved They ain't got no girls When they on they lonesome They just hate on us While I'm stacking up Get my paper up I don't need them no sir They can't hang with us there you go. You can hear that there's a pretty significant volume difference, even though it's just 1.5 dB. Getting a little bit more of the vocal, a little bit more high-end energy, it feels like, to be honest. Limiters do that sometimes. It increases the presence of certain things. But it's doing what I want to do. The safety net is working, preventing us from clipping, and increasing the overall level. Now, the final limiter, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to set my output ceiling to minus one. This is to optimize it for streaming platforms because streaming platforms do recommend, like Spotify, they recommend that you have at least a one dB of headroom for the transcoding process when it hits their platforms. I'm going to set my release to be about the same, let's say 50 milliseconds. Set my attack to be the slowest that it can be. I'm not going to use any oversampling or dither or any of that. I know some people like to do these things. Don't like adding dither for noise and oversampling is cool, but sometimes it affects transients in a negative way. So I've been very wary of using it lately. However, if you do use oversampling, you can get, you know, more detail in your mix, but sometimes at the expense of transients. Now, just for example purposes, I'll leave the style on transparent as well. However, we can, of course, play with this using the L2 if we want. And by the way, I'm using this Pro L, but you can use anything that you want, right? You can use the Waves L2. You can use an isotope plugin. There's so many different plugins out there. Focus on what I'm trying to do rather than what I'm using to do it, okay? So now that I've got my settings all set up, slow attack, faster release, one dB of out ceiling to prevent us from clipping and create that headroom for streaming, I'm now gonna just dial this up and bring it up. And I'm gonna listen. I'm probably gonna try to get a decent reduction, maybe from two to six dB, depending on how I feel. But I'm gonna listen to the integrity of the transients. I wanna listen to the drums, the rhythm section, and make sure that it's not getting destroyed right because obviously when you're limiting stuff you're really clipping it in a way right you're preventing it from peaking and a lot of these louder elements are what's going to suffer in the process so let's do this very gently i might even just dial it in one at a time adding one two three four db and continuing up from there here we go i know what's involved they ain't got no girls when they on they lonesome they just hate on us while i'm stacking up get my paper up need them no sir they can't hang with us i know what's involved they ain't got no girls when they on they lonesome they just hate on us while i'm stacking up get my paper up i don't need them no sir they can't hang with us i know what's involved they ain't got no girls when they on they lonesome they just hate on us while i'm stacking up so I'm gonna pause it here. I'm purposely pushing this just in case anybody's wondering what the hell I'm doing. Now, when I hit six, we really start to hear that there's a loss happening, right? It sounds louder, sure, but we could tell that the frequency spectrum is kind of falling apart a little bit. Certain frequencies are coming up more than others. Um, you know, the actual transients and the dynamics of the track are really suffering. Things aren't hitting as hard. So this is obviously too much, right? Sometimes you have to push things too far to understand where it should actually be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dial this back down. And I found somewhere between that three to four dB range was pretty solid. So let's go down to like three dB again. I know what's involved. They ain't got no girls. When they on, they lonesome. They just hate on us while I'm stacking up. Get my paper up. I don't need them, no sir. They can't hang with us. I know what's involved. So yeah, 3 dB is definitely the optimal place for this. This is where I really like how this sounds. You know, it's it's not killing everything. It's sounding good. Um, I'm still getting the dynamics intact. I have all that intact and I like what's happening. So that's the four step process. But just for example's sake, let's remove everything and play what I started with and then show you where we ended up. So here we go. I know what's involved. They ain't got no ghosts. When they on they lonesome, they just hate on us While I'm stacking up, get my paper up I don't need them, no sir, they can't hang with us I know what's involved, they ain't got no girls When they on they lonesome, they just hate on us While I'm stacking up, get my paper up I don't need them, no sir, they can't hang with us 
So there you have it. That was my four-step mastering process. Again, this is not the end-all, be-all. There's a million different ways to master a record. However, if you're new to mastering or if you're still figuring it out, I think following this four-step process should really help you achieve a louder and fuller master that you can now translate onto different platforms, streaming, different environments, all that stuff. If you got value out of this video, once again, I ask that you please smash that like button. That would really help my content reach more people like yourself. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do that and hit the notification bell so you can get notified every time I drop a new video. I drop something new every single week, always focused on helping you sound better and helping you make more money with your music. I appreciate y'all for watching. If you have any questions or if you want to see anything in a future video, definitely leave it in the comments below and I'll see you next time. Peace. Five.